today invasive strategy is a preferred reperfusion strategy in patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction. The history of invasive strategy is inseparably connected with evolution of generally accepted PCI technique, increased number of valid CAT labs, and evidence base. Application of invasive strategy was started approximately 20 years ago as an accessory pass for revascularization. The classical bailout indication for primary PCI was cardiogenic shock because thrombolysis did not prove clinical efficacy in this subset of patients. The second indication for primary PCI was the subset of patients rejected from thrombolysis due to contraindication, primary due to bleeding contraindication. In this period, we also first saw the term adjuvant PCI indicated in patient with large infarction and failed reperfusion post-thrombolysis. Further development of invasive revascularization strategy was justified by introduction and widespread use of coronary stenting, the accumulation of operators' experience and the growth of number of valid cat labs. Evidence-based data finally proves the place of invasive revascularization strategy. In this stage, both fibrinolysis and primary PCI were equally legitimate. Primary PCI was generally preferred in high-risk ST elevation MI patients, high clip class and cardiogenic shock. In patients with contraindication from thrombolysis when symptoms onset was greater than three hours ago, and when skilled PCI cut lab with surgical backup was available in strict time interval. Three kinds of invasive strategy were discussed in this period. Primary PCI in thrombolysis eligible or in eligible patients. Rescue PCI in patients with late presentations of shock or thrombolysis failure. Facilitated PCI, based on competitive use of pharmacological and primary PCI approach in order to achieve speedy reperfusion. Facilitated PCI was recommended in high-risk cardiac patients when PCI is not immediately available and bleeding risk is low. Later, this concept was rejected due to frequency and significance of coexisting pharmacological and procedural complication and unproved efficacy. Further development of reperfusion strategy defined primary PCI as a recommended strategy in patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction. This period shows a tendency to expand indications for invasive strategy. First, in this period, we can see widening of time limits criteria for routine opening of an infarct-related artery from 12 hours or less to 24 hours. Second, the introduction of the concept of delay PCI for patients with failed thrombolysis, reocclusion, unstable hemodynamics and ischemia. Third, for the first time we saw a recommendation for catheterized patient after successful thrombolysis before discharge. Practically, it means that invasive strategy before discharge could be considered in every ST elevation MI patients primarily treated by thrombolysis. 
This stage relates to changes in the decision-making flow in order to consider invasive strategy as an obligatory part of the treatment plan for all patients. In this group of patients initially admitting to PCI-capable hospital, primary PCI was defined as a primary reperfusion strategy. In the group of patients initially admitted to a non-PCI-capable hospital and treated by thrombolysis, invasive strategy had to be immediately planned after transfer, urgently after failed thrombolysis, and early for delayed PCI. Today, the role of invasive strategy is defined as preferred. This statement includes a new concept, routine early PCI. Routine early PCI is indicated not only in patients after successful thrombolysis or in patients who did not receive reperfusion therapy, but also in patients after primary PCI that did not undergo complete revascularization. The last tendency is to consider complete revascularization pre-discharge which could be done during primary PCI or staged. The pharmacoinvasive strategy suggests use of single or multi-stage invasive procedures in all patients with ST elevation MI in order to achieve complete revascularization pre-discharge. This slide shows the evolution of the decision-making algorithm in patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction from accessory value of primary PCI for patients rejected from thrombolysis to the preferred role of primary PCI and complete revascularization pre-discharge. Technical aspects of primary PCI also underwent evolution. The very prominent change was of generally accepted femoral access to radial. Clinical features of patients with ST elevation MI and pathology of culprit lesion have played a major role. The need for aggressive antiplatelet therapy associated with local bleeding complications. ST elevation MI in patients with higher bleeding risk, patient's comfort, equipment dedicated for radial access systems, operator's experience and evidence base all have to do with the radial approach becoming preferable. Today, routine radial access is a class 1 indication in this subset of patients. Here is a head-to-head -head comparison of radial versus femoral approach in patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction. The main advantages of femoral access are less access failure and the support for large diameter catheters in complex primary PCI. But this is important in a relatively small number of cases, radial access diminishes local complication and is more comfortable for patients post-procedure. In the majority of cases, in high-volume PCI hospitals and with experienced operators, the advantages of the radial approach are predominant. 
the evolution of primary PCI is inseparably connected with the evolution of generally accepted PCI technique. POBA, applying and developing coronary stenting, development generation of drug eluting stents, and use as a main revascularization approach. Initially, applying of coronary stents in patients with ST elevation MI was cautious due to estimated risk of stent thrombosis in the site of thrombus burden vulnerable lesion. This argument was taken into consideration also for stent selection, bar metal stents versus drug eluting stents. It was supposed that drug eluting stent is associated with increased rate of stent thrombosis in this subset. It was the consensus that drug eluting stent should not be used in primary PCI for patients who are unable to tolerate or comply with a prolonged course of dual antiplatelet therapy because of the increased risk of stent thrombosis with premature discontinuation of one or both agents. Bar metal stent should have been used in patients with high bleeding risk or anticipate invasive or surgical procedures in the next year. The latest generation of drug eluting stent have a minimal prothrombotic profile due to stent struts and the new polymers or without polymer mechanism of drug delivery. Latest trials and meta-analysis proved the use of drug eluting stents in patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction is safe and improves clinical outcomes by reducing the risk of reintervention compared with the bar metal stents. Today, new generation of drug eluting stents is generally recommended class 1 indication in patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction. It is important to take into consideration the challenges of coronary stenting in some subsets of ST elevation myocardial infarction. These subsets include certain clinical situations, urgent character of procedure, hemodynamic status, rhythm disorders, patient discomfort, and features of culprit lesion as a thrombus burden vulnerable lesion with compromised coronary flow. Stent implantation in the site of the thrombus burden is associated with risk of no reflow or slow flow, underestimation of infarct-related artery diameter as a result of spasm and underflow challenged selection of proper stent size. Optimal treatment of complex lesions is limited by attitude of culprit lesion and risks of complications. Uncertain benefit of coronary stenting in small infarct-related arteries and for treatment of distal macroembolism. It is a fact that the majority of PCI-related distal embolization developed after stent implantation. Also, a stent implanted in infarct-related artery with low timigrate flow does not improve coronary flow. A no reflow phenomena is also associated with stent implantation. Understanding primary PCI features justify the development of new invasive concepts and dedicated devices. One of these is a concept of deferred stenting. 
the rationale of this approach is to select patients with predictable risk for procedural failure due to distal embolization and no reflow and split procedure to steps. First, recovery of coronary flow by balloon and medicine. Second, to achieve better short and long outcome by coronary stenting. Meta-analysis of nine randomized studies evaluated the efficacy of different versus immediate stenting. There are no significant difference were observed in the incidence of no slow reflow between deferred and immediate stenting. Compared with immediate stenting, a deferred stenting strategy showed an improved left ventricular function in the long term. Today, routine use of deferred stenting is contraindicated class 3